Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Tanya Nisimova, cellist and composer, not of this piece. And this is uh, Lydia Frumkin, pianist and a friend. We have just performed for you Beethoven's last cello sonata. Basically, we picked up where we left off last time. We performed the first movement for you back in June, and today we repeated the first movement and went on and finished the piece. First of all, I would like to thank you all for watching. I know that there are people watching across the world, and uh, it's really an honor to play for you. We're two months shy of Beethoven's 250th anniversary. And um, it's uh, only fitting that we would start this program with this glorious piece. Uh, today is different from uh, the June concert because uh, afterwards you will be able to um, ask questions. You can write your comments right now and after we're done with our program we will try our best to answer your questions or uh, speak aloud about the comments or maybe you, you'll see what everyone else is writing. We met with Lydia almost 20 years ago. <laughs> I can't believe it. <laughs> uh, we played we actually, I think we started our, our collaboration with the Beethoven Kreutzer Sonata. Yes. It was a little bit ambitious, to say the least. Beethoven wrote his Kreutzer Sonata before he wrote the sonata we just played for you. So technically, this is his middle period. It's a very tempest-like piece. It's uh, dedicated to a Polish virtuoso, Bridgewater. And then something happened. <laughs> Between Beethoven and Mr. Bridgewater was a mulatto and uh, maybe was very popular with the ladies. Uh, and Obviously, his virtuosic playing helped him to be so popular. And Beethoven and Bridgewater apparently fell in love with the same woman. So dedication was changed. It is now called Kreutzer Sonata because it was rededicated to Rudolf Kreutzer, who was an esteemed violinist of the time. Apparently, Czerny, Beethoven's pupil, arranged this piece, uh, Kreutzer Sonata for cello and piano, but um, it was, and uh, Beethoven approved of the arrangement, that was the first ever arrangement, but apparently cello was playing in a very low register and um, the arrangement never became popular. Then Frank Holm arranged uh, this piece in a, basically played like a violinist on a cello. So maybe that was the other extreme. I hope that you enjoy my arrangement where we'll play for you the first movement. It starts with the adagio sostenuto and then it is followed by presto.
This was the Kreutzer Sonata by Beethoven, for those who just tuned in, originally for violin and a piano, but performed here on a cello and a piano. This is Lydia Promkin. I'm Tanya Nisimova. We gave our due to Beethoven because in two months we're celebrating his birthday. By the way, no one knows the exact day of Beethoven's birth. All we know is that the child was baptized mm -hmm. on December 17th. So apparently it was somewhere a few days before that, but sometimes people would baptize the child a little bit later. So it may be that he was born um, early in December. But this, at least we know that it was in December of 1770. It's a quarter of a millennium and his music is popular as ever. 
Lydia, what do you think? Why, why is he so much in our minds now, quarter of millennium later? Because he is Moses. Because he is Moses. Moses. <laughs> Explain. <laughs> Elaborate on that. <laughs> Please. I think you just listen to it, and uh, it, it never gets old. Yes. Never. Gets yes. Old. This is this is it. You know that that child within. When Beethoven was writing his uh, last cello sonata, please, by the way, we we welcome the comments, your comments about the fugue, the final movement of the cello sonata that we did just prior to this uh, <coughs> piece. What? is that music. Think, how do you want to answer that question? What is it about and why is it there? By 1815, and that's when Beethoven was writing this piece, this and the uh, fourth sonata, he was completely deaf. So he was living in his own, more than ever, um, he was never a social type or a uh, crowd pleaser, <laughs> even in his youth, but um, he was completely in his world. So his music, fragmentary, sometimes sounds like stream of consciousness. Lydia and I came from Russia. When we left Russia, it was called Soviet Union. And the country we left is non-existent, but we still miss the land, we miss the people, and um, uh, our sound engineer is reminding us we depend on your donations. Please, uh, if you're watching at, uh, attentively, this is wonderful, uh, and um, we appreciate it, but it will be great if uh, you can support the arts. We support our essential workers. But you know, in a way, musicians are also essential workers because we work on the most important thing. What would be the world without musicians? What would be the world without musicians? Who would be we be without music? Who would we be without music? without art. We give pieces of ourselves when we perform. In fact, I was, as I was driving here, I was thinking, it's really a piece of my happiness, of my excitement about <laughs> what I do, right? That's, that's what we give, right? So it's not easily translated into currency, but uh, the nations are very appreciated, and we're working here, setting up. There are two wonderful men here, um, Jeff and his assistant, who are who have made this possible and using this state-of-the-art equipment and this beautiful space. So uh, it'll be wonderful if you could support us, show your appreciation. We will continue with Glazunov, Alexander Glazunov's Chant du Ministrel, Minstrel song. Troubadour, trouver, travers, ministrels were traveling musicians. They were like knights of the round table. <coughs> they were sometimes uh, there was an existing uh, beloved, distant beloved, who they would dedicate their songs to. Sometimes that distant beloved would be an imaginary being. But these people were, in a way, like nowadays uh, the touring musicians are. They traveled, and that's how they made their living, and they composed their songs on the road. Glazunov dedicated this song to Virgilovich, who was an amazing cellist, amazing Russian cellist. Chant du Ministrel by Alexander Glazunov.
This music is originally for cello and an orchestra. So all of those solos that you've heard with your play, they are played by woodwinds, by flutes, oboes, clarinet. But in a way, I prefer it with a piano. There's more than you can, that you can do, because I've heard multiple players perform it with an orchestra. Yes, of course, you can hear the whole palette, this whole um, abyss of registers and tempers and everything. But at the same time, because it's the orchestra, it's very um, metronomical, because it needs to, everybody needs to be together, plus everyone has their solos, their dialogues, and the cellist is uh, restrained. The cellist is in a sort of in a box. He has to follow the baton of the conductor, whereas the piece is very improvisatory. It's almost like this uh, bard, this this um, songwriter. He's just improvising, so it needs to be free. Free. Exactly. We have uh, one more selection. This is not often performed. Um, this is called Romance by Scriabin. Yes. Um, do we know of any works that Scriabin wrote for cello? <laughs> I'm not really familiar with those. <laughs> Scriabin was a Rachmaninoff's rival. Rachmaninoff and Scriabin, their styles, um, well, as now, decades later, we see that um, there are certain, not decades, now more than a hundred years uh, <laughs> later, we see um, that their styles, you can tell that they come from the same period. But um, the, in this particular romance, which is actually also for a French horn, can be done on a French horn and on a cello, it reminds me of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony, the second, second movement. It's a very brief romance by Scriabin. A little bit peculiar. It's a little bit peculiar. <coughs> it ends strangely. It is what it is. <laughs> I would like to give Lydia a rest and uh, would like to do something different. Something different. I was thinking various things. So maybe we can um, do a 
First I'll play some Bach for you and then maybe I will do an improvisation. You see, we're getting used to it. I'm sitting here and Lydia is sitting here. Jeff is sitting there shaking the sound. And I'm imagining you, all of you, watching us and uh, <clears throat> listening. It's an interesting experience. I think we we'll all will come out stronger after this pandemic. This is Bach, Saraband from Suite 1 in G major. Yep, Schroeder, a violinist from Holland, who practiced authentic style and was friends with Harnan Kurt and Arnold Bildsma. Very important figure. I met him while I was at Yale. He called the whole world of Baroque music one ornament. He called Baroque music an ornament. But in a way, it's really true. It's like a big brush. Right? It's, it's, it's all, it's, uh, 
it's sparkly and it's hard to look for essence because it seems to be all on the surface. And I very often I tell my students, you can't just learn Bach. You can't learn Bach. You have to live it. You have to just basically pick this sheet music, go lay in bed, look at it, go listen to it, walk it, dance it, sing it, pluck it, create your experience with it like with a person. Otherwise you'll just play notes. But then the reward comes because once you get into that world, it's irresistible. It is just, it's about everything. You're sick, Bach is right there, ready to put his shoulder for you. You're happy, yes, Bach is right there. You are well, not just Bach, Handel, Telemann, Couperin, Corelli, Vivaldi, oh, but they're, they're amazing, they give you energy. And sometimes um, romantic music, which we all love so much, it actually exhausts our energy. <laughs> Beethoven is the first romantic in that sense. <laughs> um, I would like to improvise something. I will tune into you to try to imagine all of you.
we will play for you a meditation from uh, Okra Thais by Jules Massenet.
This uh, concludes our program. We thank you very much for watching. I'd like to remind you that this is a concert, so if uh, you please um, follow up with your donations, would really appreciate it. I will look at the uh, live chat. Please bear with me. This is my first time and I'm not sure I can <laughs> do it well, but I will try, try my best. It led me to Facebook. Lydia, what do you think about the program that we just did? I would love to hear what your thoughts are. You worked as much as I did. That is quite a program. <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, I cannot open the chat. Maybe you should go on your, <clears throat> on your. Okay, I'll try one more time. Okay, I would like to play for you one more because I see it's still 3.08. I will play for you a flamenco by Yuge Etagel. And uh, for those of you have, who have asked questions, here comes the train. By the way, for those of you who have watched my videos and my videos with Lydia in the past, Jeff was the sound engineer and this was the place where we made these recordings. And it's quite interesting that sometimes you have to stop, let the train pass, and then continue. <laughs> because the floor is shaking. <laughs> okay, so here goes. You get a girl. Thank you. 